Welcome back to More BS. I'm Chef Babette. And I'm Shabnam Islam. And today we're going to be talking about something a little bit sensitive. Racism. Ooh. Now, racism is something that can be felt from many people, many communities, and in many ways. And so I thought it would be best for us to kind of share our personal experiences um, because even those events have built us to who we are today. True that. You know, the very first time somebody said something um, racist to me, uh, that I, I, I felt like it was racist as a little kid, mm -hmm. my godmother, oh, hateful, she used to do janitorial work at Venice High School oh, back in the day. When it was, yeah, and there in the summertime, uh, since she was my caretaker, I would have to go to work with her sometime. They had events uh, where kids could bring their skates and they had skate, like little skating activity. Well, I brought my skates because I was at work with Godmother and put my skates on and it was nothing but Caucasian kids. And this little Caucasian boy looked at me and he said, you looking for another nigga to play with? I'm sorry, I'm using the N-word because I'm I'm repeating him verbatim. Normally I wouldn't use that word. And I'll never ever forget that for as long as I live. I didn't say anything to him, but nobody had ever really spoken to me like that. Um that 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 was horrible That's and I was scary. really really little too but where did that little kid I know he he might have been a year or so older than me or he might have been my same age but wonder where he is now and if I wonder does he still feel that way as he got older because I'm come on I'm in my 70s now but looking racism for is another, taught yes, you know like I also had a similar experience my my mom I'm first generation American my parents came here from Bangladesh so uh, they're all citizens now um, but when we moved here, when they moved here, I was born here. Uh, my mother was a first woman of color international hire at University of Richmond. She's a professor of physics. Uh oh. She's and so that's in Richmond, Virginia, nice. the first mm. in 1986. Mm. And so I was three at the time. And then we were at, we went to a daycare center right by our house. And I remember, you know, we were also like, we grew up poor. You know, we lived across the street from one of the most expensive neighborhoods because my mom wanted me to be in the school district, but she couldn't afford she a house there. The house so we something. lived right outside and we rented a bedroom mm. from an, an older lady across the street. And I remember when I went to, when I went to school and daycare the first time, you know, my mom would pack me lunch like dal, like lentil oh, and, and rice. And like, what are you eating? And they would make fun of me. They would be like, oh, she's eating poop. Um, and no oh one God, sat with me. No one sat with me. Nobody sat with you? You went through that? Yeah, it makes me kind of sad now that I think about it, but, you know. <clears throat> Look how many kids are still going through that kind of stuff. When you, when you do that to children, it, it stays with you. You never feel good enough. You never feel white enough. Um, and I always, if you've ever seen that movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, and the, the, the girl is like, oh, I just wanted to have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and sit with all the blondes and brunettes. That's all I wanted too. I just wanted to be a part of it. And I think my, my mom <clears throat> did a very good job. She really matriculated us to the U.S. She always cooked hamburgers and she really tried to make it seem like when I walked inside mm. the house, it was a dual home. Right. It smelled like rice and curry. But also when my friends were over, I always had spaghetti and, and hamburgers and the traditional American lifestyle. I was in volleyball and music and choir. And she really did her job. But um, that was really hard. And, and I, I, I want to say something about that. Ra racism, a lot of times we all can get into the, I, I can't call it a habit, but into the moment of being racist ourselves. Um, my mother, um, I've stated this over and over, my mother had a third grade education and my mother loved Caucasian people. She loved other races, but she, in particular, she loved Caucasian people. She was working for private families at age seven. She had to stop going to school. 
they had her caring for their kids and also cooking. They, as, as a kid? At seven. Oh, my God. They wanted to take my mother to the family that she was working for. Was They were going to Paris, France. And they wanted to take my mother and my grandmother absolutely not you will not be taking my daughter my grandmother because they were in north carolina my grandmother felt like i'll never see my child again period no you are not getting ready to take your own little worker with you but it just oh my mother wanted to go so badly my mother had three was it two or three black men in her life well i know the two my father and my sister's father. And my mother was treated so poorly by those two men that when my mother got rid of them, she would only date outside of her race. Hmm. Um, primarily Caucasian guys. Uh, I can re remember her being with an Asian and a Latino guy, but I remember my mother saying this. Now, please don't judge me. This was my mother, it, and it was hideous. It was hideous for her to say this, but my mother used to say it. My mother used to say, "I, there's nothing a black man can do for me but show me where a better white man is. Oh, my gosh. <clears throat> my, mother, my mother has said that so many times. Well, you know, for me, it really bothered me that she would say something like that. Absolutely. Because as I was younger, you know, in the 60s, I'm like Black Panthers, I'm all over Malcolm X, I'm listening to Martin Luther King. As a matter of fact, for me, Martin Luther King was weak. I was with Malcolm X, who, who, who needs to be doing all this marching and singing by any means necessary? My mama talking about a black man can't do nothing but show me where a better white man is. Wow. All of that's racist. Yeah. All of that is racist. And for me, where I am now consciously, Shab, I understand the connection of the whole. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just come from different places. Yeah. We are human. There is one species. The beauty of all the complexions, the beauty of our our land where we come from and how we grew up and that food you ate as a kid. Mm -hmm. Even the food that I ate as a youngster. It's like those, those are the things that we share with each other, our differences. Mm -hmm. But instead, we get caught up in this ignorance, this silliness. And and then you start, and, and what other races do I'm going to tell you right now what racists do. They look for fault in the race that has mistreated them. I want you to be wrong on everything you do. You think that ain't happening? You think that that's not happening? Do you know how often I hear this? Well, it wasn't us that messed up the water and the air and the soil because we ain't in charge of nothing. We ain't running nothing. It was them. We are separated. We're blaming each other for every single thing. And if you feel like you're the powerful and you're over everybody and things get to be messed up, who you think they're going to blame? Mm -hmm. You think they're going to take the blame themselves? No. Things are a hot mess right now because we are responding and behaving very, very ignorant. Very. And it's, and it's cyclical. <gasps> so it's rooted in your culture. I remember in your, like when we say, oh, my, my food, it's cultural. Well, so is racism. Thank you. And so uh, I grew up in the South. I grew up in Richmond, Virginia. And so south of the Mason-Dixon line, part of the Confederacy, where there's still monument, on Monument Avenue, there's still Confederate statues lining mm. the street. And mm. during, during the pandemic, it was all getting removed. I don't know if you guys remember all of the news about it, but uh, it, it's, it, that's a big part of history. And so the interesting oh, thing is, is yes, when you see going. that over and over again, it becomes part of your norm. Like, for example, I was in it was the second grade, in second grade. My, my teacher was handing out cookies and you, she said, you only touch one. And I put my hand over one and I go to touch another. And she's like, put your dirty brown fingers back. You don't no, even get a cookie. No, she you touch did both. not. No, she did and not. And I was the only person. No, in the she class. did not. And I 
and when I went home, I was crying so much because I was upset that I didn't get a cookie. And when I told my mom verbatim that it was, she said, put your dirty brown fingers back, sit down, you don't get a cookie. That's when my mom stepped in because she was like, that's that racist. was my first time of realizing the label, my baby. Of, the label of racism. And, and you attacked her complexion in front of everybody front else. Of every student in that class. Let me tell you what a teacher did to me. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I was at Altaloma Elementary School living with a hateful godmother. Mm -hmm. She had given me a couple of bucks to buy some bread. I remember that. I remember there was supposed to be change brought home mm -hmm. after I bought whatever it was she had me, and I believe it was bread. Well, there was a little Caucasian girl that sat at my table in our class, and our teacher was Caucasian. And I can remember this little girl, she stole my money. <gasps> yeah, her name was Roxanne. I'll never, of Roxanne, course was. little Roxanne. Anyway, Roxanne stole my money. And I was, I was just like, Godmother is going to kill, kill me. me. You do not understand who this lady is. And uh, you know what the teacher did? Huh. The teacher made me stay in class while she let Roxanne and the rest of the students go because she acted like I was going to do something to Roxanne and Roxanne had my money. So what Roxanne, there was a little, a little corner store across the street from this school and Roxanne met me at the corner store, bought the bread and kept the change and bought candy. No, she did Yes, she did. Bought candy and everything. And I was stupid enough to take the dang bread when I know Godmother was going to ask me for the change you when I got home. that little white girl. Affair? I did not. I did there not. There is no but, violence to but recommend to hear. But the so. point is, Godmother was going to ask me for the change. I would have been better off saying the money got stolen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I just felt like it was more important for me to get, get the bread. bread. Home. But what about the teacher? What about the teacher? I was Roxanne's age. If I say my money is missing, I think Roxanne took it. You don't take up for Roxanne. Oh, I got another story for you. Please oh, tell okay. me another one. So we're in fourth grade now, okay? We're just going to go through the years because y'all need to hear this shit. We're sitting and we're talking about slavery. And I am, again, the only brown person oh, in the class. Me. And my best friend's sitting across from me. And, you know, we're just doing a teacher talking about slavery. And she goes... Excuse me, Mrs. Show. What would have happened to Shabnam at that time? You know, because we're Indian, we're Bangladeshi Ooh. descent. We, it's still colonization. India, British, Britain, Britain took over India. But my my teacher, with a very uneducated answer, was like, "Oh, she'd probably be a slave." Straight up, just said it like no, it was conversational. She did not. Oh, she'd probably be a slave. And I just went. Oh my god. And my friend oh just my went. God. And oh that god. was the end of oh it. Oh my god. No conversation, no discussion, no no examination of where I am culturally from, Bangladesh, southeast of India and Pakistan, which means you have no geographical knowledge. Oh my gosh. I can't believe. And no understanding of, of history, at least British colonialization. Oh. So this is what you tell a nine year old. Oh my god. Probably, but what if, what about now? You have we're gonna talk about the state of Florida in particular. You don't want black history taught. Oh, now, critical now, race now, theory. Wait, okay, now, I always, I was always under the impression, this is what I was taught. We learn history so that we don't repeat the crap. That's why you need to understand what caused, but now you're saying, and I'm going to tell you what black folks believe. A lot of black folks believe the reason you don't want people to know about that history is because you plan on repeating it. Not even that. It's what we call white fragility. You are so offended and so taken back by what people of not color, of what your maybe your 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 ancestors have taken a part of, that ugh, you are so embarrassed by it, you can't even acknowledge it. That's your white fragility showing. You don't get to ban, exclude, 
actual historical it education. It is the history of the United States of America. Because it doesn't suit you. You brought people on ships. In the holes of ships. And you have no problem. From all over. Glorifying the Confederacy along the streets of, of southern states like Virginia. But you have a problem talking about the right history in a classroom? Come and on. let me tell you something about that white fragility. It is incredibly problematic. When I had written my um, accepted, well, written my letters to, you know, you have to write a, a statement of purpose to go to college. And I applied to NYU. And I, I started off with the sentence that said, she's as white as you and me, says my best friend. And the point I was trying to make, because my best friend, Sarah, and I love her to death, and it was after I got my degree, my doctorate in education leadership and policy that I had a conversation with her. Because she used to say this all the time. Oh, she's as white as me, you and me. And that is so incredibly racist and problematic. I'm not white. Just because I speak this way doesn't make it a white way to speak. But that's that's exactly what everybody says. Stop stop, stop claiming that as your own. But it is an educated way to speak. It is articulate. It is nothing to do with my my whiteness your or lack thereof. And oh my the God, irony just... of it was that I had got I didn't get accepted into NYU because NYU was a pretty woke school, and they were like, "Oh my God, this girl is." embodied in racism and she doesn't even realize that she's victimized by this and she's being turned into thinking that oh my God. a token person for the white community and it took a really long time for me until literally the last five years wow. to start doing the research to realize what is colonialism to seek and destroy you know to really look at the definitions and be like wow how has this been a part of my culture how has this been a part of my upbringing um, and I think the most poignant one was when I went to college. When I went to college, it was in 2001. Um, uh, as soon as I got there, August 2001, three weeks into my, my tenure there, 9-11 happened. And I went to JMU. JMU is a predominantly mm. white school in the South, in Virginia. I wanted to be close to my family and still play volleyball and do these things. Mm -hmm. And so it was uh, two and a half hours from home Ooh, by drive. They beat you up, didn't they? Ooh. As soon as after, three days after the 9-11, I was walking home from UREC, which is like the, the recreation center, and you have to go under a tunnel to get back to Eagle Hall where I was staying. And I'm walking through the tunnel, and I just hear three male voices. Oh, and I, you know, no. like you just, you're like, oh. No, no. And I look back, and one's got a baseball bat, no. and they're coming. And I just start running. I just knew. And they're like, come back here, you towel head. Come back here. Like, calling me the N-word and a towel head and a terrorist. Like, these bitches don't know where I'm from. But they knew that I was brown. Oh, my God. And I was God. alone. And they beat the shit out of me. They like, caught you? They caught me and put me in critical care. And if it wasn't for my friend Ben who found me and chased them off, I probably would have died there on the spot. And so after oh going to the hospital and getting taken care of, my parents, I wrote a, a very big letter to the president of the of the school saying, you know, this is this is my school too. I am an American. I'm the definition of American. Oh I'm the God. American dream. Immigrants coming to this country, having children, bringing them, being able to successfully send them to college. And now I'm a victim of racism on my own home ground soil. So I left school, school for my first semester. Like I couldn't be there. That and I, was, that's horrible. I had a meeting with the president, with my family, and they felt <sighs> disgusted by it. But what did they do? What did they really do for me? They did nothing, they did nothing, nothing for you. Nothing. But wait a minute. Let's take this a step further. Now, we don't talk politics. But I am going to make a point right now. Because I do watch this stuff. And I watch it every day. There is so much racism in our government until it is heartbreaking. We vote these people into office. Now, you do have a group of people that they're racist to, and they want to put as many racist people uh, to govern us as they possibly can. But you have a lot of people that are not, that just want the country to be a better place as a whole. But some of the ignorance that these people are shouting out nowadays is hideous and embarrassing. And it's just, it's a sad state of affairs that we live in a country 
where are and it's a country that you got a woman standing out in the in the in, in New York saying, "Come one, come all. We don't care who you are. They got the light and and they don't even mean it. They're so messed up over the complexion, whether you're messed up over a Caucasian complexion or a black complexion or a brown complexion or a red complexion, know this. Something the hell is wrong with you. When I was 20, I was visiting my brother three years after I was in college, my junior year, I was visiting my brother at MIT. My brother is an astrophysicist. He's fucking genius. He's brown though. Sorry. Um, so I was visiting him at, in Boston. I get off the plane and I get pulled over like by, by the screening, the TSA. I'm a college student, got nothing on me, don't travel. They brought me in the back, they strip searched me, oh, cavity searched poor me. Poor baby. For no reason. My last name is <sighs> Islam. Mm -hmm. Born in the USA. Why am I coming to Boston to see, see my brother? Maybe it's like some chemical warfare. I don't know what the fuck that was, but it was the most traumatizing experience of my mm, life. Poor baby. But like, how many of you have ever dealt with anything like that? Been pulled over by the cops? unruly handled taken to jail for no particular reason strip search and look i'm black and i've never had those things happen to me i, I mean because i'm obviously black you look muslim or indian, indian. you look, my last name is yeah, islam, it, 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 like, islam yeah, so, so and they they were really really mean to to muslim people after 9-11 so what we're creating oh in this God. in this country is a culture of unacceptance and ignorance and it is it is your individual role to combat that yes um to stand up for these injustices to be woke and push love and, and to, unity and to really actually say something when there is an injustice because to be silent against forms of injustice is the voice of the oppressor. Right. You don't have to do the oppressing to be the oppressor. Yes. You can stand by and still be an oppressor. There you go. So have a voice, do something that is great for yourself, great for others. Understand who you are on this planet. You're, you're just a human. And move the needle forward because um, the way that this, this world, not just this country, this world is going it is going to get more increasingly dangerous, more increasingly dangerous. And we care. And I think that's the role of the vegan, that's the vegan plight. Uh, we see it as our religion. We want to give to others, make it a healthier, happier place. And, and why not? It's such a great, our planet is so amazing. Mm. There's so much to offer and there's so much for us to share with each other. And there's so much love that we can share between the two of us, between all of us. And, and even through all of those traumas, you can still choose to be a good person. Exactly. It's never too late. Racism aside, you don't, just because you're subjected to it doesn't mean that you have to be a product of it. Um, wow. Good little we'll sis. Gonna wrap it up? I'm gonna wrap it up. All right, y'all. Let us know what you do. Well, let us know what you think. Make sure to comment below and subscribe. And, and we'll, know we love you. We do love you. And we'll be seeing you next time.